evening to our speakers, chairs, and audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. We are back again with the brand new month of quality educational lectures just for you. The first speaker for today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Masasumi Fuji. Professor Fuji is a full professor and chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Fukushima Medical University, Fukushima, Japan. His research and clinical interests are focused upon brain tumor surgery, skull based surgery, neural basis of language, and other higher brain functions and image guided surgery. He is an integral part of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and he has published several articles in various peer reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today he's going to talk about skull based techniques in head and neck cancers. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Xiaolong Yang. Professor Yang is a professor of interventional neuroradiology at the Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. He is a deputy director of the interventional branch of the Chinese Committee of the Stroke Prevention and Control, and is also the deputy director of the Chinese Medical Association Neural Intervention Diagnosis and Treatment of Collaborative Group Committee. He is one among the top 10 doctors of China neuro intervention from year 2012 to 18, and he has performed more than 4,500 neuro intervention procedures, including complex intracranial aneurysms, brain AVMs, dural AV fistulas, intracranial artery stenosis, and spinal malformations. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker for our webinars, and today is going to talk about dural AV fistula, classification, treatment, and results. The chair for the first session of today was Professor G. Tang. Professor G. Tang is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the Beijing Suanu Hospital, Capital Medical University, China. He, his interests are mainly focused upon image guidance techniques and mainly in the surgical management of pain lesions, particularly skull based tumors. We are extremely grateful to Professor G. Tang for accepting our invitation to chair this session of webinars. The chair for the second session of today is Professor Yoshi Izumo from Japan. Professor Izumo is the Associate Professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Nagasaki University Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, Nagasaki, Japan. His research interests are mainly focused on cerebrovascular surgery and he's an integral part of the Japanese Society of Neurosurgery and Neurointervention. He has received many honors and awards for his contribution to neurosurgery. He was named the best doctors of Japan in the year 2021 and he has also received the previous investigator award of the Nagasaki Medical Association. He has published several articles in various leading journals and we are extremely honored to have him today to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Harshal Agarwal from Mumbai is our special co-host for today. Welcome, Harshal. He is a pediatric neurosurgery fellow at the Wadi Hospital, Mumbai, and he's a part of our education committee team of the ACNS. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my regular co-host for today. So we can start with all your permission, Professor Fuji's lecture. Okay, I will share my PowerPoint. My name is Masazumi Fuji uh, from Fukushima, Fukushima Medical University. And uh, thank you very much. And I, I would like to express my sincere uh, appreciation for uh, Raja and uh, this committee members and uh, delegates and the colleagues. And uh, today I uh, would like to talk about skull based surgery for head and neck cancers, uh, which is uh, maybe not so familiar to all the neurosurgeons. So uh, I just wanted, I, I just want a young neurosurgeons to know this field. Uh, so let's start my presentation. Let me introduce myself first. Uh, I graduated from Nagoya University School of Medicine, 1992, and I did some residency of, for a few years, and then I stayed in Boston, Massachusetts, General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and did some research work. And then I came back to Nagoya, and I worked for Nagoya University and its affiliated hospitals for more than 10 years. And then year 2015, I moved to Fukushima, uh, Fukushima Medical University. And then actually I just become a professor in chairman department of neurosurgery, Fukushima Medical University. COI disclosure. I have no financial conflict of interest to disclose. Uh, Skull-based surgery for head and neck cancers is basically an M-block 
with section, with safety margin, and with construction. And that is quite different from ordinary neurosurgery, uh, for example, for meningiomas, schwannomas, and gliomas. Uh, and the goal of this surgery is to achieve a cure, uh, even for those malignant uh, tumors. So uh, I would say it's worthwhile, rewarding, and attractive field of surgery for neurosurgeons. Welcome to the deep and the wonderful world. And definitely, this surgery is team surgery. And uh, team surgery members are neurosurgeons, of course, and otolaryngologists or head and neck surgeons, and sometimes ophthalmologists for resection part of this surgery. And uh, important part is uh, plastic surgeons uh, for reconstruction part of this surgery. And this team surgery is also supported by psychiatrists for our mental care for, of the patient and the speech therapist for swallowing and the speech and kind of things. And uh, basic rules of resection, I will tell you. Uh, the very important thing, do not touch, do not cut in the tumor and resect the tumor so as to wrap around with healthy tissue. That's a very important philosophy of this surgery. And of course, internal recompression is prohibited. Uh, this is quite different from ordinary brain tumor surgery because we usually uh, debulk the tumor before removing it. And of course, this is for protecting the surrounding brain tissue, but for you know curative resection, uh, you know this rule: uh, don't touch and don't cut in the tumor. That's very important. And uh, regarding re reconstruction, uh, we should use well vascularized tissues or flaps. And uh, one, uh, you know big material is free flaps using rectus abdominis, lateral thigh, latissimus dorsi, omentum, etc. And of course, free flaps, free flap, flaps are, you have to uh, anastomose arteries and veins under microscope. And we also use gallial flaps. Uh, this is fed by superficial temporal arteries. And I'm going to talk about curative resection lines. And this, you know, resection line depends on the tumor invasion grays. And uh, uh, this grade, uh, it's a sim simple one, not invaded into the uh, intracranial space. It's just touched to the skull base bone outside. And then you can do epidural resection like this. And then if the bone is eroded, that means the tumor invaded into the skull base bone itself, or maybe attached to the dura, you will have to remove also the dura. So resection with dura is necessary. And the third one, the tumor invaded into the intracranial space uh, beyond the dura matter, and then you have to resect the tumor with brain. So let me uh, explain more uh, about the invasion grade. So invasion grade one, the tumor is close to the skull base bone or attaches or maybe reached to the skull base bone of the inferior aspect. Uh, this is grade one and do not you know, reach, uh, still do not reach the upper surface of the skull bone. So then this is invasion grade one. And the invasion grade two, it attached to the dramata or maybe a skull base bone is already eroded or reached 
uh, the tumor reached to it at, at the surface of the skull base bone, you know, superior surface. And then this is, this is going to be our uh, invasion grade two. And this is the invasion grade three. Apparently, uh, the tumor uh, reached to the dermometer or maybe more intradural space or maybe even intra uh, brain parenchyma. And then this is considered to be grade three. And for grade one, uh, tumors, epidural skull base resection uh, is uh, done. And uh, grade for grade two, resection with the dura uh, is uh, necessary. And then uh, for grade three tumors, uh, uh, brain, you know, removal is necessary too. So this is the examples of the grade. Uh, this case is a grade one because uh, the skull base one is still intact. So the tumor may attach to the lower surface, inferior surface of the skull base one, but not uh, reached to the upper surface. So this is considered to be grade one. And next uh, image, so as you can see, the skull base bone, a part of the skull base bone here is already eroded. That means uh, the tumor probably goes uh, reached to the skull base bone, that, but not uh, inside the intracranial space and the dermata is still intact. And then grade two. And next, uh, this is also grade two. The bone structure is already er eroded. Here, this is uh, Petra's bone is eroded. So this is considered to be grade two. And next, uh, this is apparently grade three because the tumor reached beyond the skull base bone and uh, extend into the intracranial space. And grade three, this, this patient shows, you know, um, uh, very much extending tumor into the brain parenchyma. So this is definitely grade three. So uh, this slide shows types of skull-based surgeries. And uh, here, this is A is anterior lateral cranial facial resection, resects uh, the anterior cranial base and the middle cranial base are uh, those uh, area is uh, incised in unembroked fashion. And number B, this is B, uh, shows temporal bone resection or petrosectomy. And this is anterior cranial base resection. And D, this is middle cranial base resection. And today I'm going to talk about anterior lateral cranial facial resection. Uh, let me explain about rec reconstructions. First, we frequently use fascia lata. Uh, this is a drill substitute and advantageous for prevention from infection uh, compared to artificial drill matter. And uh, because this is a free tissue and not vascularized, so uh, this fascia lata should be preferably covered with a vascularized tissue. And uh, next we use uh, sometimes pedicle per periosteal flap and the periosteal lies uh, just un underneath the gallia, gallia and just on the skull. This is a periosteum. And uh, however, this periosteum flap is very useful and convenient, but it's thin and vulnerable and it's, it's not necessarily vascular rich. So you have to be you know, cautious about this. And next, uh, we uh, sometimes use a pedicle gallia flap. Uh, this is gallia uh, lies on the periosteum and uh, STA, uh, superficial temporal artery, supplies of this gallial tissue. And the uh, gallia flap is very thick and firm and very vascular rich. So, 
I think it's a very、uh, good member of、uh, reconstruction. And、uh, however,、uh, this yellow flap, you know, you, you, you take elevate it、uh, maybe in the scalp,、uh, then this scalp blood supply may be compromised, and eventually、uh, thinning of the scalp o c c u r after surgery, and this is going to be cosmetic, cosmetic issues. So、uh, you have to take care about this. And、uh, in terms of gallium flap, so we frequently use this、uh, temporal parietal gallium flap, not frontal head area, because、uh, temporal parietal area、uh, is advantageous in terms of cosmetic、uh, point of view. And we elevate this,、uh, you know, this is a you know, wide. Pedicle the gallium flap、uh, supplied by the bilateral STA, and this is a bipedicled, we call it bipedicled temporal parietal gallium flap. And、uh, after we elevate this, then this gallium flap covers wide area of, of、uh, anterior cranial fossa. And then Uh, actually, we can use both、uh, pedicled periosteal flap and the pedicled gallia flap. As you can see in this image、uh, here, this is a pedicled periosteal flap, and this is,、uh, this is not bi pedicle, single pedicle, but、uh, this is a gallia flap. So we can use both of them. And next member of reconstruction material. Uh, is uh, free muscular cutaneous flaps and、uh, using this rectus abdominis, lateral thigh, latissimus dorsi, and antebrachium. Those are frequently used to、uh, free muscular cutaneous flaps.、Uh, and this is、uh, very you know, much well vascularized and enough volume to fill a large surgical defect. And of course, microsurgical anastomosis of both arteries and veins、uh, is necessary by plastic surgeons. And rectus abdominis actually is often used for the anterior lateral cranial facial resection because it is very, you know,、uh, has a wide, you know,、uh, defect. So, anterior lateral cranial resection needs those rectus abdominis.、Uh, Relatively large free flap. And、uh, I think it's a、uh, uh, next member is a free or mental flap.、Uh, this is also well vascularized and uh, uh, importantly fit well to a com complex shaped defect and resistant to infections.、Uh, this is,、uh, I think, it's very useful free、uh, flap. But you need laparotomy and also microsurgical anastomosis of both arteries and veins、uh, by plastic surgeons. And、uh, reconstruction of a facial nerve, sometimes we have to do、uh, because we sometimes sacrifice facial nerve to resect the,、uh, the tumor. And、uh, those, you know, two of them are often used in subtotal petrosectomy. Okay, next,、uh, let's move on to the anterior lateral cranial facial resection、uh, to remove those areas, this area, the anterior cranial fossa and middle cranial fossa in an en bloc fashion.、Uh, this is an article、uh, published by Kiyoshi Saito, who is my mentor,、uh, regarding the management of the cavernous sinus. In e m b r o c resections of、uh, malignant skull based tumors, and he classified into three types of, of resection、uh, regarding the cavernous sinus manipulation. And、uh, type one epidural, type one is epidural、uh, CS, means、uh, cavernous sinus elevation, and、uh, epidurally CS is、uh, elevated. After cutting those optic nerves, SOF, 
and the man, ma maxillary nerves. Uh, so this is a, uh, basically epidural resection. And type 2, uh, you know, you cut into the cavernous sinus. So you go into the inside of the cavernous sinus and still, however, ICA, internal carotid artery, is preserved. So this is a type 2. And number 3, type 3 uh, is total cavernous sinus resection. Uh, with sacrificed ICA, so uh, all those territory is removed. This is type 3. And of course, uh, in type 3 resection, you have to reconstruct the ICA, so that means probably high flow bypass is necessary. And after those uh, cu cutting those uh, you know, territory, you go into the sphenoid sinus, and uh, then you go into the, after you go to the uh, sphenoid sinus, you cut the uh, inferior wall of sphenoid sinus, and go to the, reach to the upper frank, franks. And uh, please note that you have to be very careful not to go to the clivus. Uh, to injure the brainstem. So uh, it is uh, very important to go to the sphenoid sinus and then uh, go to the upper pharynx. That's uh, the, one of the keys of this surgery. And uh, let me ex explain about the indications uh, of type 1 uh, resection. Maxillary and paranasal intraorbital malignant tumors with skull base invasion. This is T4, very advanced, locally advanced uh, malignancies. And uh, inv intraorbital invasions, but no involvement of orbital apex, optic canal, superior orbital fissure, and or cavernous sinus. That's important criteria. And the tumor should not extend to the posterior half of spinoid sinus. That's uh, key two. And no involvement of ICA, of course, and no metastasis. And uh, we have to get appropriate informed consent from the patient, uh, including ophthalmectomy. So this is a photo of the just before surgery. Uh, to uh, give you some idea of the skin incision. This is wide, you know, a big C-shaped skin incision to, to get a wider operative field. And next, uh, this is a slide uh, showing the final view of the resection of, of this patient. So you can see the brain covered with uh, dural matter. And here this is the nasal cavity is exposed. This is actually uh, buccal of the nasal septum. And here you can see the tongue and the wide area of the you know maxilla and the until lateral skull base is already removed. And this is a uh, specimen uh, you know you removed. And here this photo is. Uh, uh, kind of from medial aspect of the specimen. And this is nasal cavity with mucosa. And here, this is until skull base. Skull base bone is exposed. And the, uh, we removed this. And this is a maxillary and teeth. So this is unblock uh, removed uh, specimen. Here is a video of anterolateral cranial facial resection, type 1 resection. Uh, first step of this surgery is front uh, temporal craniotomy with orbit, orbital rim. And cut the olfactory nerve here. And cut the maxillary nerve. And cut the mandibular nerve. And open up the optic canal and uh, inside it, to cut the 
optic nerve and the artery, ophthalm ophthalmic artery is cut. And then uh, now here, as you can see, dura mater is kept on the side of the resection. And they go cut into the bone after elevation of the CS, uh, Kevin and sinus, and they go into the sphenoid sinus and remove the tumor in an block fashion. And uh, uh, cranotomy is returned to the bone and here re reconstructed with abdominal uh, rectus uh, free flap. Uh, let me show you another case. This is 70 years old male adenocystic carcinoma. And as you can see, uh, the tumor is located in the lateral aspect of the orbit and invaded into the bone here too. And also invaded into the uh, temporal muscle too. So uh, we have to incise this tumor here, not cut into the temporal muscle anterior part. And another point is here, as you can see, uh, the anterior skull base, a part of it is eroded. That means the tumor reached to the skull base bone and you have to uh, cut the dura on top of this. So this is the important aspect of the surgical strategy. This is a preoperative simulation. We'll uh, cut inside the uh, skin around the right eye. And this red line shows the osteotomy line. And we'll cut uh, this area. And next, this is the uh, another angle. And this red line shows uh, skull uh, cutting line here. And uh, as you can see, the middle wall of the uh, orbit uh, is kept intact here, not cut. Uh, this is another angle. And importantly, because tumor is invaded into the temporal bone, uh, we'll cut here and keep this area uh, on, the, on the resection side. So uh, let me show you a video. So after head fixation, now uh, incising and uh, you know removing area of the skin, and then here you know uh, this part uh, be kept kept on the side of the uh, section. Here after craniotomy, dual dual incision. Uh, because a part of the anterior cranial base must be incised in an end block fashion. So now dura incision is made and then we go into the skull base area and remove the, remove the anterior phenol process. And here now we are cutting now the superior orbital fissure and then elevate the CS have no sinus from the bone and now uh, open the optic canal and cut the optic nerve and next this is a little tiny fossil here now inside cut the bone of the sinus sinus and this is much like a and uh, uh, remove in the tumor in an end block fashion. Duras attached to the uh, cell. As you can see, this is uh, frontal dura, this is middle cranial muscle. Here is the temporal muscle. Step uh, on the side of the uh, removing cell. And here uh, we use the fascia lata. Of it's a reconstruction of a drill defect, and we use to uh, free flap of the rectus abdominis. 
So this is uh, uh, the image. This is a pre-operative image, and this is a post-operative image. And the tumor area is completely removed. And here is the uh, post-operative photo. So let me explain about our outcome of locally advanced maxillary sinus carcinoma, uh, T4. And uh, this is uh, overall survival, uh, quite uh, uh, good, 62.7% five-year survival rates. And uh, it is better than uh, previous report, 48.3%. And the further analysis shows a uh, negative cavernous sinus invasion patient uh, has a better outcome, 72.4% five-year overall survival rate uh, compared to the positive cavernous sinus invasion, which is very poor prognosis. Only 20% survives after five years. So uh, further analysis done uh, to pick up the and focusing on the cavernous sinus uh, negative invasion negative patients and uh, negative margins surgical margins uh, the, those patient is very good prognosis reached to 79.7 almost 80 percent survivors is obtained a very good prognosis as uh, but however positive marks if the so the surgical resection is not enough uh, the prognosis uh, uh, poor 45 percent five-year survival and in terms of uh, newly diagnosed and recurrence case uh, actually newly diagnosed patient is uh, has a better prognosis uh, 80 percent uh, five-year survival. So, uh, based on those uh, findings, uh, now we think uh, that type 3 resynxis is not necessary. I mean, no indications, actually, uh, because the tumor is already go inside as cavernous sinus and the apex of the orbital area uh, this is very difficult to achieve cure. And the other one is cases with tumor extension to the postal half of the uh, sphenoid sinus. As in this figure, uh, the tumor invaded into the sphenoid sinus and attached to the postal wall of the uh, sphenoid sinus. That means, you know, uh, as you can see, you cannot uh, keep the safety margin inside the sphenoid sinus because uh, the tumor invaded into the sphenoid sinus not only uh, at the anterior part but the, also the posterior part that means you you cannot you know uh, get a clear uh, safety margin so uh, this is an, not a good indication uh, or no indications of this kind of curative surgery. So take home message, uh, skull based surgery for head and neck cancers is a multidisciplinary team surgery of neurosurgeons, otolaryngologists, head and neck surgeons and plastic surgeons. And uh, this surgery is capable of achieving cure with as good as 80% five-year survival rate for locally advanced cancers. And this is a very rewarding and attractive field of surgery, very educational for young neurosurgeons to learn living skull-based anatomy. Uh, you know, you can witness uh, the structures which is supposed to not to injure. But in this operation, we cut. We must cut those uh, vital structures, and we can see and learn how it looks like. So, it's a very good uh, educational educational opportunity as well. And we need the passions and enthusiasm and the skills we need, definitely. 
So acknowledgement, uh, I want to thank everybody in this list, Fukushima Medical University, Neurosurgery, Otolaryngology, Plastic Surgery, and Aish Medical University, especially Neurosurgery, uh, Kenichiro Iwami, Otolaryngology, Yasushi Fujimoto, and Nagoya University, Plastic Surgery, Yuzuru Kamei, and other guys. Uh, I want to thank everybody. And uh, here is a Fukushima Medical University, and this is a I think a beautiful place. And uh, after the pandemic is overcome, please come to Fukushima. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, it was a wonderful presentation. Finally, Professor Jitang has joined us. Professor Jitang, thank you so much for joining. Can you hear us? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I can see, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry for my light. Something wrong with my computer, but I didn't miss uh, the most important part by the professor Fuji to give a <laughs> very wonderful the lectures about Thank Algeria. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I learned a lot, you know. I, I'm a scholar with neurosurgeon. Okay. I, I think I totally agree with you the uh, scholar's team should include the neurosurgeon and head and neck. And plastic yeah. surgery, we can do this uh, good job for our patients. Yeah, right. Otherwise, right. we cannot do so many so very wonderful the surgeries. Thank you, thank you to share your expertise with ours. But, but my question is, how about your comments for mm -hmm. the endo endoscope endoscope in in uh, the endoscope? Uh, yeah, yeah, endoscope. <laughs> I think it's very important the tools for the yeah, surgery. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but uh, it's uh, you know uh, for this today's topics uh, until that will, uh, you know, craniofacial resection, the tumor invaded in the wide area. So I mm -hmm. think it's an uh, endoscope. The role is lim limited to this field, but okay. I think it's a good candidate is probably anterior skull base resection. You know, uh, end nasal and nasal cavity olfactory neuroblastomas. Those are, mm -hmm. you know, uh, nowadays endoscope is, I think it's really, really useful. Okay. I think so. so yeah, and I, I know that we are very concerned about uh, post-operative, the CSF mm -hmm. leakage. So mm -hmm. for, for you, expert, for in experience, do you use the, the post-operative lumbar drainage? No, for no the... never use, never use. Never use. Oh. I have never, you know, uh, complicated with CSF leak, CBR1, you know, um, because of the uh, very tight closure with mm. fascial artery and the flea flap is attached. Okay. So it's very vascularized and it's uh, no problem. So you mean with a very good vascularized uh, tissue, you mentioned yeah. the pedicle, yeah. This kind right, of material, right, right, right. Uh, and uh, this, you know, uh, gallial bipedicled gallia flap is really strong. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, agree. I perfectly rely on that. Okay, so I'm also very in interested to your the your mention about the no indication. Your the last two cases, you mean if the the legion in case the the cavernous sinus. Right, it's a right. no indication surgery. So how about the third? How about the treatment? Chem chemotherapy. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Chem I we did we do uh, sometimes chemotherapy or chemo radiotherapy first, and if the tumor shrinks and Treat. there's no no invasion into the CS, maybe we plan the second look surgery. You know, our uh, unblock resection. Mm -hmm. Maybe if the chemo radiotherapy is very very effective. Okay, so how, how about the proton beam? Proton beam the, uh, is another kind. The proton beam yeah, proton, is a- is uh, the Proton beam, better? probably the, uh, no, the carbon, the carbon beam, carbon beam is carbon better. Beam. Proton beam is not enough, I think. Carbon beam oh. is probably maybe okay, but uh, I would say surgery is superior, much more superior to, to carbon beam because 80% uh, you 80%. know, five-year survival, that's fantastic. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, for your for surgeons, we rely on our hands. Okay, right, and the hands right, motion. Right, yeah, right, we right, can already right. do this uh, for our patient. Okay, thank you, thank you. Can we to have some of the audience uh, questions yeah. from our audience? Right. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very wonderful presentation and uh, you stretched the boundaries of skull based surgeons by removing it and block. May I call upon a few of my uh, audiences? Yes, my co host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Liu, can you hear us? Thanks, Raja. Uh, thanks. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Thanks, Raja. Thanks, uh, Professor Fuji, for a very uh, exciting uh, topic. Uh, Professor, I, I wanted to find out from you intraoperatively, uh, how best do you uh, identify a negative margin? Uh, do you actually send it for frozen you know, to, to make sure it's negative? Yes. And in, in your opinion, uh, why is there any recurrences uh, in cases with, where you confirm negative um, uh, margin and What's the reason that you think most likely recurrences happen? Uh, secondly, uh, in, in regarding the invasion, especially to the bone and dura, uh, do you rely purely on the GEDO uh, MRI or you do other scans such as a PET scans or bone scan, uh, other metabolic scan to look for the uh, extent of the uh, tumor? Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Good questions. I think for the first one, uh, we use, of course, frozen sections. Uh, many frozen sections we sent to the pathologists and we, you know, uh, listen to them. But the most important point is, of course, preoperative strategy. Uh, SALA investigation of the image CT scan. We use CT scan, MRI, and also FDG PET scan. So those three scans and we evaluate the tumor invasion area, and we try to uh, resect all the area, but uh, still we sometimes encountered the positive margin. And uh, I, uh, you know, I showed you, but uh, those positive margins cases are not so good. And especially adenocystic carcinoma, for example, it's not so malignant, but its invasion is very wide. and. It's invisible, invisible on the you know imaging modalities nowadays. So adenoidocystic carcinoma, we usually cut more, maybe nerves chased, follow the nerves and the cut uh, very you know a distant part. Uh, we try to do that. So maybe uh, yeah yeah. So it's uh, pathologies depends on the pathology, but uh, we do. Uh, you know, try the best. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Professor. I, I would like to ask Professor uh, one question mm -hmm. that in patients where you have to resect the internal carotid artery along with, mm -hmm. okay, so when do uh, time a bypass for this uh, patients, if at all you want to do a bypass? So when it, when it is it done? How many weeks before or do you do along with the same sitting? What is your uh, uh, same yeah same sit, setting we we did we did a, a few cases but uh, as you can see you know I we experienced five cases uh, but all of them are CS invasion you know cavernous sinus invasion and the prognosis was very poor so I would say you shouldn't sacrifice ICA you know uh, this is a big risk so now my. I, our strategy, uh, CS invasion cases, uh, no, no, no indication of sacrificing ICA. So in, in the previously we challenged, but uh, unfortunately it's not so good. So I wouldn't, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to recommend you to do so. Right, thank you very much. We'll take one question from my special co-host, Dr. Harshal. An excellent lecture, so very eloquent. Actually, I I don't have any more questions because uh, right. they were already answered by Professor. Doctor Ajitar wants to ask them question. Professor Ajitar. Yeah, yeah, it's a very excellent and informative talk, which has shown light on very uh, unseen areas. So the question I want to ask is something uh, pertinent to the our recent times, because uh, COVID don't rise and uh, uh, rampant use of steroids 
uh, has uh, we have seen a lot of mucor mycosis and uh, many a time this endoscopic excision won't uh, do much good because it's extending into the orbital apex then into the cavernous sinus many a times into the uh, temporal uh, lobe so uh, what is your uh, strategy uh, maybe uh, out of context to the topic we are talking but uh, you are experienced skull based surgeon who are doing a very excellent job you may have come across this thing what is your uh, strategy in uh, managing this sort of cases uh, i'm so I, i couldn't catch you for language i'm sorry because well, because you because uh, mucor mycosis uh, mucor huh? mycosis uh -huh. of the skull base which is very okay. common now uh, due to the rampant use of this corticosteroids for covid uh -huh. sorry sorry i don't <laughs> i don't have any good answer to that sorry about that <laughs> okay we understand that so i think we'll go back to our chair professor g tang to hear his uh, concluding remarks professor g tang okay thank you thank you the everyone thank you the professor fuji to give us a wonderful the lectures on the uh, the head and neck is a uh, surgery it's uh, quite challenging the cases for the uh, skull based surgery and uh, it's a very good summary and uh, thank you again thank you again thank you very much okay thank, thank you very much here a few words from our temporary chair professor shubin also professor shubin any remarks from your side Uh, hi raja uh, congratulations pro uh, professor uh, fuji for your uh, uh, this year you just uh, be the chief all oh, right congratulations thank you very much, yeah. you very much. <laughs> yeah 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 regarding uh, the 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 malignant tumors uh, invaded the ica actually i have some i have already did 12 cases Mm -hmm. uh which the uh, almost uh, all of the cases are uh, nasal pharyngeal carcinoma mm -hmm. they uh, normally uh, they invaded uh, to the facial wall of the ICA so mm -hmm. i uh, was asked to perform the revascularization for the uh, ENT, ENT surgeons mm -hmm. so after the revascularization of the uh, brain they can do the totally remove of the uh, carcinoma so mm -hmm. uh, every case was uh, successful uh, because i uh, normally do the uh, one side uh, the from eca uh, radio artery or sometimes uh, even use uh, uh, saphenous vein to mm -hmm. the uh, to the mca then the other side i normally use uh, mm -hmm. uh, sta mca double bypass so normally it can revascularize will revascularize all the uh, brains okay uh, excellent yeah. excellent right yeah thank you very but, much but if tumor so in some cases in... we still can uh, do the uh, bypass before the uh, total removal of the uh, uh -huh. malignant tumors yeah okay okay yeah. thank you thank you Thank you, thank you very much. That those were very important and uh, very uh, valid points. So the timing of bypass for uh, malignant skull-based tumors. With that, we come to the end of first session. And for the second session, I would like to invite our honourable professor, who is a Professor Suyoshi Izumo, who is the chair, who will say a short introduction and invite Professor Yaolong Jan. Professor Suyoshi Izumo, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I would like to welcome all of you to this session. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to chair this session. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have Professor Zhang as our next speaker. The title is Dural Arterial Venous Fistula Concept, Classification and Treatment. Professor Zhang, could you please yeah. start your lecture? Okay, hello everybody. Good evening. And uh, I'm Dr. Zhang. And from Huasha Hospital, at the same hospital as uh, Dr. Xu Bin, uh, Fudan University. It's my great honor to give the lecture in the in this webinar of the Asia Conference of the Neurosurgery. Especially, I'd like to give a thank to Professor Yok Taku and Professor uh, Xu Bin for the presence of the webinar. Uh, the topic of my uh, 
what I want to share with, uh, with you is the Dura Atrovenous fish, fish tutor. The concept classification and flow dynamic rehabilitation. And the DAVF is not only the fissure. Basically, DAVF is a kind of venous disease. Some of the trauma, inflammation, malignant tumor, some drugs, especially the steroids can cause the inflammation damage of the uh, dura with the venous drainage obstacle. And then the fish levels occur. The symptoms including the brain, eyes, ears, nose uh, will happen. But in some cases, the headache will be relieved or disappeared after the proptosis of the tetanus. That means maybe the venous drainage free or uh, well, or uh, goes well, can reduce the headache. So the strategy, uh, treatment strategy was to canalize the venous channels all and uh, occluded the fish tutor. For the etiology, we canalize or open, we open the venous channels and eliminate the, tri uh, the triggers factors such as the inflammations and the use of the steroids is very important. And uh, for the clinical presentation, a glute the fish tumor is helpful, but not necessary in some cases. Since the fish tumor will shrink or even disappear after the recanalization of the venous drainage. So our treatment method not only the endovascular operation, but also included some med uh, medications. As we know that uh, this is uh, the brain circulation, the, the pier the vein, go to the bridge vein, the up, uh, the upflow sinus, the downflow sinus, and then go to the jungle vein, vertebral vein, and then have to communicate with the emissary vein. That's the, brain, uh, that's the normal one. But if something happened, something wrong happened at the brain vein, or some block at the up sinus, downflow sinus, or even the emissary vein, that the fissure will occur. So according to the location of the fistulas depends depends on depends on the location. Oh, oh this case. De depends on the location of the venous transit block. Uh, we divided uh, divided into the three uh, classifications. The, sin the sinus type, the brain type, and the amethyst type. First of all, I want to introduce the sinus type. This type is the most common one. And uh, the reason may be the damage, or stenosis, or even the occlusion of the sinus and the downflow sinus, uh, downflow veins. The fistula occurred at the adjacent to uh, upflow of the sinus, but not all of the sinus type has a severe stenos sinus stenosis, and some of the fistulas occur at the adjunct the downflow of the sinus, sinus, not the upflow of the damaged sinus. So the obstructed venous damage via the sinus resulting in the cortical ven uh, venous reflex. The dilation of the focal dura vein from the pre sinus space, that's very important. And the treat treatment strategy for this type is recanalize and protect the sinus and occlude the fissure only if it is necessary. The second type is the bridge vein type. It is common and sometimes it's, it's very simple. To, to treat it with, uh, 
uh, with amyloidation. The brain driven cannot drainage to the sinus due to the occlusion of the brain driven space, specific segment, which adjusted, adjusted to the sinus. In this type, the fissure located in the bridge vent sinus complex. The pure vein reflex and drained into the venous sinus via the uh, venous collateral circulations. And occasionally with the stenosis or occlusion of the sinus. But most of them, the sinus is the normal. For this type of the um, for this type of the uh, fissure, the treatment strategy, uh, we focus on the precise fissure occlusion. We canalize the sinus if only if it is necessary. The third type is the M3 type. This is the less common and it's very difficult to give a precise uh, diagnosis. Uh, this type is fitted by the accessory artery and the dural arteries. The dilate, dilation of the emissary vein from the pre sinus space we call a venous lake. And uh, many of them are companion with the stenosis or occlusion of the sinus. The treatment strategy is uh, as the same as the orange vein type. It is a precise fissure occlusion. We canalize the sinus only if it is necessary. These two types is similar, but the M3 type is very difficult to give a diagnosis. So we um, separate as a solo type. I want to use a series of cases to interpret my ideas and uh, this, uh, the treatment strategy for this specific, for this new classification. The first series is the uh, sinus type. This is the bilateral ECA. We can see the fissure is at this, at this area and the Supersagittal sinus is, is reflexed and at this point have some stenosis. And from the vertebral artery angiography, we can see the, the fissure is also here. And from this picture, we can uh, find the, the fissure is here. It's the dural vein, it's not the bridge vein because it's, it's just uh, the, the artery is from here and then go back to the sinus and go back to the sinus. No reflex to the pure artery, uh, pure uh, venous. And here is the uh, the details of the uh, fissure here, and here is the fissure. Here is the drainage vein. Maybe we can call it is the uh, pre sinus uh, space. It's not the uh, it's not the bridge vein. And this re reflects to the bridge vein, and the pier vein is from the. Uh, uh, superior superior signal uh, digital uh, van, uh, sinus and uh, from the uh, venous approach we use a balloon to occlude to um, angioplast do the angioplasty of the uh, superior signal sinus and then we did the microcaster angiography and here is the fissure is here. It's the pre sinus space. And then we open the balloon 
did the microcast angiography again, and uh, no pure uh, venous reflex was occurred. So it makes it it is the the dural uh, venous is not the brain vein. So this uh, type is um, belong to the sinus type. And we did the, the balloon angioplasty of the superior uh, cigital sinus. And the posterior circulation uh, fissure was gone. We didn't uh, did the embolization of this one. Maybe it's because we opened the uh, surgital, uh, uh, superior surgical sinus. And here is the post angiography, shows the uh, uh, superior surgical uh, sinus was free, was flow freely. And then we put a stent here. And what happened at the end is the, the fissure was almost gone by with the, the uh, Bilateral ECA check. This is a post angiography. And the right ICA angiography, pre and post. And one week to follow up, we can see the brain vas uh, circulation was recovered, recovered very well. And here is a pre post operative. The superior sagittal sinus was recovered. And one week later, it's much better than before. And from the lateral view, it's much clearer. Here is a pre operative angiography, and here is the the post-operative and one week later, and from the venous, uh, from the sinus, uh, sinus phase, we can see the brain circulation was recovered very well. A second case is, uh, the lateral, uh, it's a lateral sinus uh, type. And uh, from the ECA angiography, we can see the proximal part of the uh, transverse uh, of the sigmoid sinus was occluded. And from the ICA angiography, we can see that the street, uh, street sinus is no function because the reflex of the uh, ECA uh, fissure. And certainly we can still say that the, the sinus, uh, the, the cigital, uh, cigital, superior cigital sinus and the transverse sinus was also occluded on stenosis. And what we did is from the uh, venous uh, approach to give uh, to give the transverse sinus and uh, sigmoid sinus, give the angioplasty and uh, the stenting de deployed. And uh, this is the left uh, sigmoid uh, sinus angioplasty. And uh, the stenting was deployed. And this angiography is the venous angiography. We can see the bilateral, uh, bilateral uh, Transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus was flow freely, 
and it's much better than before. And the result is pre, this is the preoperative angiography. The fissure is here. And this is the post. The fissure is almost gone. It's here is maybe a little one. But three months later, it's much smaller. And 17 months later, the follow up, the fissure was totally gone. Certainly, after the operation, we give the medicine just like the antiplatelet and, and uh, anticoagulation. And here is the pre-operative, post-operative, three months and uh, uh, 17 months follow-up of the ECA. What about the internal, uh, internal, the, the brain circulation? This is the preoperative. This is the, the right ICA angiography and the post angiography. And three months later, the brain circulation was, goes very well. The left ICA angiography still can show in the recovery of the brain circulation, especially the bilateral uh, transverse sinus and the sigma, sigma is the sinus. It's recovered to the normal. The post circulation can still show the bilateral, this is the pre-operation operative. The bilateral uh, transverse sinus was was stenosis or even occluded. And here is a three months follow up. And here is a 17 months follow up. The post circulation was recovered very well. And another case is the hematoma and the ECA angiography. The fissure is here, and it's isolated. If you want to use another language to talk with me, you can in Siri. It's isolated uh, sigmoid sinus, and the fissure is here, and the feeding artery from the uh, internal carotid artery. We just opened the proximal part of the sigmoid, the occluded sigmoid sinus. And here is the post-operative. And then the fissure was totally gone. And here is, this is the pre and this is the post. This is the pre. And we can see the, the sinus, what happened about the, the sinus. This is the pre. The transport sinus was occluded, and here the transport sinus, some of them are opened. And here is the post circulation. We can still see the left transport sinus from the occluded one to the reopened one. Another uh, case is about the commonest sinus fissure. This is the ECA angiography. We can see that here is a fissure and uh, the blue one sh shows the pre-sinus space, I think, because it's the uh, focus part of the fissure. And the red one is the ophthalmic one, the reflexed one. And uh, this part is the reflex to the uh, deep, uh, deep vein. But the, the inferior petrol sinus was occluded. So how to treat this one? And uh, this is uh, the AP view. We can show the fissure was focused on here, 
and we call this one is uh, the prisoner's space because all the fish are uh, accumulated here and this is the common uh, venous part. We just uh, embolize the ophthalmic, ophthalmic um, and the deep one side and the common one from the fissure is here. At last, we opened the occluded uh, inferior um, petronas, uh, inferior petrol sinus, inferior petrol sinus. And uh, this is uh, the result. This is the poster operative also. There's a little uh, fissure here but the inferior petrol sinus was uh, reopened. It becomes uh, uh, a good one, no reflex to the ophthalmic or even the, the deep one uh, reflex. So it's become the good one. So we followed with the medicine. So the medicine we often use the, is the aspirin and our warfarin to antiplatelet and anticoagulation. And another similar case about the common sinus fissure is it's the same that the inferior uh, inferior petrol, uh, petrol sinus was occluded. So the here is the common uh, venous segment and uh, reflex to the several vein. And uh, here is the internal carotid artery angiography. Shows the same venous part. And uh, here is the common venous part. Here is the common sinus, occluded uh, inferior uh, petrol sinus was not shown here, reflex to the, uh, reflex to the uh, several vein. And uh, first of all, we use this. Uh, uh, we use this occluded in uh, inferior uh, petrol sinus root, and uh, to this to this specific uh, common venous common venous part, and uh, we coiled this common venous part and then opened the inferior uh, petrous sinus. And here we can see that the inferior petronal sinus was reopened. And the result is that when we do the internal carotid artery angiography, this is the, the the uh, cerebrum, the cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus, and the inferior petrol sinus. Also, uh, all of them have the function, just like this. And this is the, uh, the cerebrum, the cavernous sinus, and the inferior petrol sinus. But four months uh, later, we uh, did the follow-up and uh, the fissure was reoccurred again. Yeah. This is uh, the, the left ECA angiography and the left ICA angiography. And what we did is just reopen the inferior uh, petrol sinus with the balloon. And what happened? The sinus, uh, the fissure was totally gone, just to be, follow the, the uh, reopen of the venous, of the 
inferior petrol sinus. Officially, it's totally gone. So uh, this part is the, about the, the sinus type. And uh, the second series is about the branch vein type. It's another type of growth. And uh, this case is a uh, bilateral ECA angiography. We can see the fissure maybe it's here and uh, some of the uh, vein was here. And uh, the superior, sin uh, superior sigital sinus was very good. No stenosis or no occlusion. And uh, it's very simple to uh, treat this one with uh, is the bilateral ECA. We can see the the fissure is here. This is the uh, suprasigital uh, sinus is very well. No stenosis, no occlusion, no obstetrical. And uh, from the detailed angiography, we can see the fissure is here. We just uh, uh, embolize uh, the fissure through the MMA. It's the typical one. So I think it's very easy to occlude this one because uh, they have nothing to do with the superior, signer, uh, superior digital signers. And uh, from the 3D and your uh, roadmap, we can clearly know that the sinus, uh, that the fissure site is here. Nothing to do with the super uh, digital sinus. So uh, this is the type of the Bridgman sinus. And another one is a little more uh, complex. And uh, this is angiography from the right ECA and the right occipital artery angiography. The rotation of the right ECA, the rotation of the the right uh, occipital artery. And all of this is a reflex of the pure uh, venous. But the uh, superior occipital artery uh, sinus is very well. No stenosis and no occlusion. The right internal cardiac angio uh, artery angiography. So the bilateral uh, bilateral lateral sinus was patent. And this is the lateral one. This part of the venous was occupied by the Reflex, reflex of the pure venous. The left uh, occipital, uh, occipital artery angiography. And the left uh, internal maxillary artery angiography. The rotation can clearly show uh, 
And here is the, the site of the fissure. It is the bridge vein, and this is the reflex of the pier vein. Left internal carotid artery angiography. It's normal one. So nothing special. The post circulation angiography has shown the post minimal uh, artery still fit the fissure here. And the bilateral uh, lateral sinus was not, not good at the angiography. And uh, from the high resolution MRI, maybe we can find some abnormal. And here is the, the bridge vein. From the 3D top MRI, we can see uh, some abnormal vessels was here. And this is the and this is the suprasigital sinus. And here is the suprasigital sinus. And here is the branch vein. It's nothing to do with the sinus. Here is the superstitial sinus, and, uh, and here is the, the fissure, the bridging vein. Just at Johnson, it's not Johnson to the superstitial sinus. And uh, from the enhancement, we can see that the sinus wall was enhanced very much. Maybe that is the damage from the high pressure or from the, or from the inflammation or something else. Anyway, it's abnormal one. It's not a normal enhancement of the dural. This is the right uh, external carotid artery, left uh, external carotid artery, and uh, the uh, water artery angiography, the uh, occipital artery angiography. We can see the, the same construction of the venous part is here. And here is the the uh, the, the bilateral uh, is the sinus face. First of all, we just included the bilateral uh, occipital occipital with the gelatin form because it's easy to do this and it is transparent. We don't like to use the onyx or coil to occlude this one. The purpose to occlude the bilateral occipital artery is to make the fissure much clear. And here is the post-occlusion of the bilateral occipital angiography of the internal maxillary artery. We can clearly see the fissure is just here. 
And here is the drainage vein, the common one. Here is a fissure. So it's very easy to treat this one. We can find uh, the reference where the left uh, um, occipital artery before it was occluded. The much more fitting artery, and here is the common is the site of the fissure, and it is the common uh, vein segment. This is the right. Uh, 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 this is the left. Uh, uh, internal maxillary artery angiography to show the fissure is here, or the feeding artery was the uh, the posterior uh, branch of the meningeal middle meningeal artery, and the right internal maxillary artery angiography shows the the same site of the fissure is here, and here is the common one, common one, common one segment the same location of the fissure. So this give us a very clear diagnosis about the site of the fissure. And this is a common one. The circle, the blue circle is the site of the fissure. We just use the routine Method via the uh, posterior branches of the middle meningeal artery to go to the fissure site and then casting the site, uh, casting the fissure and part of the common venous segment with the onyx. It's much easier and it's much more confidence. So here is the post-operation angiography. The fissure was totally gone from the ECA, ICA angiography. And the brain circulation was recovered totally. And here is the uh, the sinus phase angiography with a rotation. We can see the fissure has nothing to do with the superior digital sinus. The sinus casting was here. And the right ECA angiography the sinus was totally gone, and here is the casting of the sinus with the onyx. And the super, uh, superior digital sinus was, was flow back well. And the brain parenchyma uh, circulation was recovered. And here is the follow-up with SWI. We can see no arterial, here is the arterial uh, blood and no arterial blood was, uh, was found here. And here is the pre-operation uh, operation disc MRI. Two months later, it's recovered Total. And here is the a comparison comparison between before uh, pre-operative you know, angiography of the right ECA post-operative and the three months follow-up. The facial was totally gone. And no recanalization of the occipital artery, even though it was embolized with the gelatin form. You know, the gelatin form is the, it's not the, 
uh, it's not, not the, uh, the best one. It is easy to recanalize, not only not like the onyx. The left ECA angiography before and the three months fall off. The facial is totally gone. And uh, let's see the internal carotid artery angiography. And here is the preoperative angiography of the right internal carotid artery. And here is the post-operative angiography. The facial was gone and the parenchyma uh, drainage was recovered a little bit. Three months to fall off. The venous was recovered very well. And here is the pre, post, and the three months to fall off. Another one, another case uh, is very interesting because uh, it's not only the, the facial, uh, it's not only the arrangement uh, type facial, but also have the stenosis of the transverse sinus. The left one, the right one was agglutinate. The facial was here, it had the reflux and then go back to the superior sinus, uh, sigital sinus. The right uh, internal carotid uh, artery angiography to show the super uh, sigital artery was uh, not well and the bilateral uh, lateral sinus was not well too. From the high resolution um, MRI, we can see the, the fissure was here. And this is the branch vein. The surgical was enhanced everywhere. So it's the damaged one. Maybe it's the, the inflammation. Maybe it's the, it's the, the thrombus. And from the details of the high resolution MRI, we can see that's the abnormal enhancement of the uh, duro. The fissure was just here. This is the bridge vein. The fissure is here. How do we know this? This is the internal carotid artery angiography at the sinus face. We can see this bridge vein cannot flow back freely. It must have something wrong here. from the anterior projection, we can see this is the pure oven and this is the bridge oven. It cannot flow back freely. The left ECA angiography shows the facial water here. AP view, the facial was here. The rotation can clearly show where the facial are located here.
It is just at the at this location. And unfortunately, this patient have the right lateral sinus occluded and the left one will have the stenosis, severe stenosis here. From the post circulation, we can still see the left, the right transfer sinus was occluded and the left one was severe stenosis at the transverse and sigmoid sinus connection here. And here is the stenosis one. From the ECA angiography, we can see the superior sigital sinus was still here. Was still here. But the and the stenosis was here. But from the internal carotid artery, we cannot see the superior sigital sinus. The superior sigital sinus was not shown here. It can only be shown with the external carotid artery angiography because the fissure was reflex. We just put a stent at the left transverse sinus. The stent was here. And then we did the microcast angiography through the middle manager artery, feeding artery was here. The fissure was here. And this is the brain driven. This is reflex of the brain driven. And this is the normal pure, pure vein. The location of the fissure was here. The location was here. So we did the lateral view and the AP view with the macrocast angiography. The the, to figure out the location of the fissure. The fissure was here, and this is the bridging vein. Flow back to the superior sigital uh, sinus, bridging vein, flow back to the superior sigital sinus, and here is the reflex of the bridging vein. We just want to precisely occluded this one and pre protect the bridge vein because this bridge vein have the function. And here is the facial side, uh, facial side. This is the supracigital sinus, the bridge vein, and uh, the site of the fissure. The typical microcatheter is at the site of the fissure. We inject the onyx 18 and a little bit reflex to the brain driven, but it's a little bit, not much more. We must pr protect or preserve the brain driven because it have the still have the function. And uh, this is the, the Casting of the onyx 18. Uh, this is the casting of the uh, fissure with the onyx 18. The branch even was a little bit embolized, but not too much. And here is the result. The fissure was totally gone. And uh, the transverse, uh, the supracigital sinus was recovered, and the function was recovered too. And uh, this is the pre -oper operation. The supracigital sinus was was not good, 
and uh, here is the post operative the fu the function of the digital uh, super digital signers was totally recovered lateral eca the feature was totally gone and uh, the transfer the super digital signers was recovered its function this is before no superior signature signers all a little bit not too much and when we occluded the fissure the brain circulation was recovered very well the lateral view preoperative and here is the function now brain driven post operative of the just the stent the super digital uh, super digital uh, signers have some of the function recover and the post embolization of the fissure the circulation was totally recovered and the brain function was preserved here this is the preoperative the brain is here almost no function post the sinus stenting it is recovered a little bit and uh, after the occluded of the fissure this brain driven function was totally recovered. So the related brain driven, uh, the function was preserved. So the last type is about the uh, M3 event type. It's seldom it's a seldom cover, uh, it's a seldom, seldom uh, type. This is the rotation of the ECA. We can say the fissure is here, and here is the commoners sinus, and the inferior petrol sinus was occluded, and the Superior patronal sinus still have the stenosis here. And this is the superior petrol sinus have the severe stenosis. So the fish, the, the blood was reflex to the ophthalmic vein. From the internal carotid artery angiography at the uh, sinus face, we can see that the, the inferior uh, petrol sinus was occluded. So, uh, where is the location of the fissure? We did the MRI. And here is the venous pouch. So the venous pouch, the venous pouch is, is here. And here is the venous pouch. And we use the Angiographic CT reconstruction. We can see that the fissure is here, and uh, this is a venous patch. This 
the fischler allow this one and uh, here is a petrol uh, bone and uh, this is the the occipital bone and this is the the tertiary bone The, this is the bilateral carotid canal. So the location of the venous pouch is at the internal opening of the carotid uh, uh, canal. It's the foramen lacerum. Foramen lacerum is here. It's here. So. We think it is the emissary vein of the foramen, foramen lacerum. It's the emissary vein of the foramen, foramen lacerum. So we have the clear uh, definition, uh, clear diagnosis about the fissure. Here is the the fissure vent support, we go through the, the inferior petrous sinus to the common sinus, then back to the common vent support. And then, then we coil the vent support and open the, the inferior petrous sinus here. This is the opened uh, angiography. And this is the post angiography of the ECA. The fissure was totally gone. And the inferior petrous sinus was opened with a balloon. And this is the post angiography showing the balloon, showing the uh, inferior petrous sinus was opened. And uh, this is a comparison before and after. This is the opened uh, inferior petrous sinus. It has a function. So the last topic is about the medicine treatment. This is the typical current sinus dual uh, arteriovenous fissure. And uh, two months later, after the medicine, the fissure was changed a much clear and a much simple one. The medicine is uh, anticoagulation and uh, anti-completed uh, uh, anti uh, anti it well, with uh, the warfarin and uh, aspirin. And this case is the, another case of the common sinus uh, fissure. This is the pre and this is the post. We coiled the common sinus, but still have some fissure here. We just follow up with a medicine treatment. One year later, the fissure was totally gone and the calmness and uh, inferior petrocyanus function was preserved. Certainly some of the case maybe can be cured by the medicine only. This is the specific cases, case, the bilateral salamus edema here. It's very serious. And the angiography shows the fissure was here and the street sinus was occluded. Internal carotid artery 
show the street sinus of the gluteid. And this is the base oven. It's almost occluded. So the fissure was, was a bad one, was reflex to the to the internal uh, cerebral vein. We just let the patient take the warfarin and six months later, the MRI shows the edema was totally gone. And we rechecked the DSA. The fissure was really totally gone and the street sinus was a little bit reopened. And here, we didn't do the embolization and uh, you know, it's almost impossible to embolize this smaller fissure. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank Richard. you so much, Professor Tang, for your informative lecture. Uh, dual ABF has complicated hemodynamics and it's sometimes difficult to understand the under architecture. But I think you have summarized them in very easy to understand manner. And I totally agree with your opinion that the golden treatment strategy for dural ABF is venocide occlusion, uh, which is a definite one for the region. I have three questions for you. May I yeah. ask? Yes, yes, please. Uh, you classified the dural ABFs in three types, sinus, yeah. parenchymal, and emissary, in yeah. which uh, anteroscarol-based dural ABF is included anterior scalp base dural ABF. Uh, uh, excuse me? Anterior scalp base ABF. Oh, anterior, uh, you mean the uh, anterior, um, just like the, the fissure was uh, feeding artery is the ophthalmic artery. Yes, that's you right. You mean that one? Yeah. Yeah. This one we classified uh, into the it's the uh, it's the the brain-driven type. Mm -hmm. It's a brain-driven type mm -hmm. because the feeding artery is uh, most of from the anterior meningeal artery, mm -hmm. and uh, then go to the uh, the brain driven and then back to the superior digital artery uh, sinus. And this type is easy to rupture, easy to have the blood. So it, it, it is not the, it is not the sinus type. It is belong to the brain driven type. So the second type. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, you mentioned that you treat the sinus type dural AVFs by transvenous embolization and sinus recanalization. But in yes. Japan, we usually treat them only by embolization. I wonder which is superior, embolization only or embolization with venous angioplasty? Could you give us your opinion or comment on that? Uh, actually, I give a lot of serious uh, cases in our lecture to show this, the privilege of the recanalize the sinus and uh, through the balloon or through the stench and uh, to show it's the, the privilege of the uh, better to the brain circulation after the operation before and after we have the good comparison. So the only uh, embolize the fissure, maybe it worked uh, with the long term, but uh, it's not as good as the, the recovery of the circulation. You know, the reason of the dural artery fissure we think is the, is the block of the 
backflow of the brain. So that's the reason why we classify the three type. This is the, the reason. So uh, in some cases, in the earlier stages, we only, yes, we did only uh, embolize the, the fissure. And the patient maybe it's, it's good, but not as good as the recolorized one. And uh, this is really can, um, can not only to cure the fissure, but also to recover the circulation. And uh, it can be improved the, the intelligence of the patient, not only to cure the fissure, it, it improved its the, the ability, the lecture, the cognitive ability. And uh, we did a lot of cases in this segment because of the time limited, I cannot give the details of the, all, the, all of the cases, uh, how the patient improved, uh, improved after the stent, after the uh, brain circulation recovered, uh, it is approved of the uh, cognition or intelligence. That's the reason uh, we, recent years, we not only, uh, we focus on the backflow of the brain or the improvement of the brain circulation, not only to occlude the uh, fissure. Uh, and uh, in some of the cases, you know, in, in my series, uh, we didn't, we even didn't occlude the, uh, the fissures and the fissure was totally gone, uh, followed with the recanalize of the sinus. Thank you, I got it. And third is that we reported the usefulness of MRI arterial spin labeling ASL method for detection of the residual or recurrence of the dural AVFs. Uh, could you show us how do you detect post-operative residual or recurrence of the dural AVF by imaging studies? Uh, most of the, certainly most of the, the golden uh, tools is the DSA, you know, uh, most of them, uh, or every case, we followed with the DSA. But uh, recent stages, we try to use the MRI, the or MRI, or uh, hyper-resolution uh, hyper MRI, to follow the, these cases. Um, maybe it it is worked with a special for the tough method. Uh, but not too much. Maybe we just follow up uh, with 20 or 30 cases. And uh, it, it, I think it's, it's, um, it is uh, a good tool to follow up with uh, treatment uh, uh, follow up. I think it's a good um, direction. It's a good direction. It's a good future. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will now open the audience to questions. Raj, is it, yeah, is it yeah, okay? Yeah, definitely. We, we can, uh, due to lack of time, we can take only one or two questions. May I invite my uh, dear friend Itti Chai, who is here? Itti Chai, are you here? Can you hear us? Itti Chai, yes. Hybrid yes. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, thank you, Professor Sang, for your nice presentation. Can I have uh, for one question? I heard uh, that about you often use the medication, especially the anticoagulant or antipellet. But uh, in my routine use, I didn't. I never used this uh, medication for treat about the uh, dural venous uh, uh, dural AV fistula. Be, because in uh, um, almost of the case, uh, the occluded sinus, uh, maybe uh, uh, the brain can adapt already to drain to another way. So I, 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 I want uh, to know about your idea, uh, how many cases that you uh, prescribe about this medication for the patient after treatment? Thank you. 
Thank you. It's a really a good question because uh, time limited, I cannot give the details how we use the medication to treat the urethral venous fissure. Actually, we have uh, three cases uh, of the uh, street sinus type fissure because the feeding artery was very small and uh, it cannot be occluded with with the um, uh, with the interventional with, with the thrombal with uh, embolization. It is it is impossible. So we treated it with the warfarin and uh, aspirin to treat it. Uh, for three uh, half years later, the patient was recovered totally, and uh, we have the the last cases was was the same one, and uh, lots of and uh, from then on we routinely treated the arteriovenous fissure with the aspirin and sometimes with the anticoagulation with the warfarin. It is really worked. Mm -hmm. And the special, mm -hmm. uh, I remember one of the cases, the common sinus fissure. And after uh, one month later uh, of the uh, aspirin, uh, aspirin medicine, the patient was recovered totally. So, mm -hmm. No surgery, no no operation was needed. So I think it's it's absolutely a good direction for the facial treatment, and uh, from the reason for the reason maybe it is because uh, to uh, to make the uh, brain circulation much better than much better. That's the reason. Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, and um, in this in these recent years, we treated the the, the fistula, the dural fistula, pre uh, pre the operation. We just uh, we will use the aspirin to to change the uh, to to give the uh, treatment. So uh, at now. In, in our center, we treated the, the dural fistula with at least two, at least one and uh, two. One is the medicine. Another one, maybe we operation, maybe not, because some, mm -hmm. uh, some cases will totally recover. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the one of my case I have been showing in this lecture is the uh, counter sinus fistula. Uh, before the uh, medication, before the medicine treatment, the everywhere was 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 very very complicated. But two months later, the DSA issues it becomes very simple, very clear, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. much easier to treatment to treat. And maybe I think I guess certainly that case was treated with amylization. Maybe I I I'm. I'm a little bit regret that uh, maybe I let it go and uh, still um, maybe long follow up, the fish love will totally go. Maybe. Mm. Right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, teacher, for that question. So I'll close this officially now. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of CGO Bukata, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers, Professor Masasumi Fuji and Professor Jia Long Jiang, and the chairs, Professor Ji Tang and Professor Siyo Shizumi, for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would like to thank both my co hosts, Dr. Liu Bun Singh and Dr. Harsha Lagarwal, as well as the distinguished faculties and audiences who have joined us today. A special thank to Professor Shubin, who is our main mentor in China, for suggesting Professor. Xiaolong Yang and broadcasting the webinar in WeChat in China. Thank you very much, Professor Shubin. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.